The following is a summary of the book, There Are No Children Here, the story of two boys growing up in the other America, written by Alex Kotlowitz. The two boys are Lafayette, who was 12 years old in 1987, and Barrow, who was 9. Their parents are Paul and LeJoe Rivers, who are separated, so Paul is not around very often. Kotlowitz spent much of two years with this family. We next portray the daily life of those of us human beings who live in a poorer area of Chicago. This human example will introduce the statistics of the social and economic indicators that are covered later. Throughout recent decades in the U.S., one in five of our children have been living in poverty. Those of us who have not lived in the poorer side of town hear only rumors of this daily life and form a vague picture of it based on few facts. The story of the lives of two boys, Lafayette and Pharaoh, will help put you into their shoes and give you a more accurate picture of life in the ghetto and what it means for our civilization. The boys live one block from the Chicago Sports Stadium and one mile from the downtown business district. The stadium is easily seen from the Sears Tower, which is one example of the capabilities of our civilization. The Rivers live in the seven-story Horner apartment complex, which is among what the residents often refer to as the projects. The Horner building houses 4,000 children and 2,000 adults and was built in 1956 with federal aid from the 1949 Housing Act. The Horner building is one of many being managed and maintained by the Chicago Housing Authority. As we hear Lafayette and Farrell's story, we will see images and video of projects in Chicago. The 1949 Housing Act was meant to create almost 1 million units of low-rent housing across the nation. This number of units would house one half a percent of the U.S. population of 150 million persons. The act helped to create affordable housing some 60 years after Rice had published his book, How the Other Half Lives. The family of LeJoe's mother had earlier moved to Chicago from West Virginia, where LeJoe's grandfather had been a coal miner. LeJoe's father had been living in Arkansas before he also moved to Chicago to find work. He got a job in a steel mill. In 1956, when LeJoe was four years old, the family moved from a barely standing building into the brand new Horner Apartments. When the family moved into Horner, their furniture consisted of a picnic table and some cots, but they had increased pride and the future seemed bright and full of hope. They were thrilled with the immensity of the five-bedroom apartment and with its shiny new paint. The apartments are made of cinder block and have unplastered walls. The bedrooms are 10 by 11 feet or 4 by 4 meters and have a 2 foot wide doorless closet. The closets were designed to have curtains, but no curtain rods were ever installed. The living and dining areas are separated by a wall that extends halfway across the room. When Horner was built, it had light poles in front of the building, a playground, and a regularly mowed baseball diamond. Children liked to roller skate in the basement of the building. There was a nearby boys club that had both a gym and a pool and the area had a 250-member drum and bugle corps that marched in city parades. Mom was active in the local Democratic Party. The area residents organized and fought for better schools and health clinics. There was a sense of community, which we have seen is important to us humans. Many Horner residents were successful persons. The hope for improving America that began with the 1949 Housing Act has suffered from funding cutbacks. The Chicago Housing Authority is responsible for the maintenance of the Horner buildings and for many others. This agency suffers from dwindling operating funds because those of us humans who set funding levels keep slashing these funds. By 1970, the Chicago Housing Authority no longer had enough money to paint the buildings. They used to be painted once every five years. The Reagan administration during the 1980s cut funding for the Department of Housing and Urban Development by 57 percent. The Community Development Block Grant was cut 28 percent 
and the Urban Development Action Grant was cut 68%. Federally subsidized housing was cut 97%, from 27 down to $1.5 billion. The Department of Housing and Urban Development was almost shut down. For eight years, the programs originally designed to house the poor and encourage home ownership were manipulated to benefit the rich who had strong political ties. A federal special prosecutor found that $2 billion had been lost to fraud and mismanagement and convicted some staff members of wrongdoing. Lejo saw the neighborhood decay. First, the middle class families moved away to the suburbs and then the businesses left. One third of the city's manufacturing jobs left within an eight year period. There is official unemployment rate was 19%. In 1982, Mother Teresa set up a soup kitchen and a shelter for the women and children of the area. Kotlowitz reports that through the years 1987 through 89, the neighborhood had no theaters, libraries, skating rinks, bowling alleys, or any other type of children's entertainment. There was no drug rehabilitation center, though drug use was widespread. There he had three aid centers, one of which had funding to support just 28 children. The infant mortality rate of the area exceeded that of many third world countries. About half the area's population was living below the poverty line, and half the residents did not have a telephone. Horner's building conditions were simply allowed to worsen through time. The baseball diamond was paved over years ago. Nobody can remember why. One side of the basketball court has a leaning hoop, and the other side has no hoop at all. The building's first floor mailboxes often get broken into. So Lejo, who lives on the first floor, has her government assistance check sent to a nearby check cashing store. That store charges her $8 to cast each monthly check. The light bulbs in the building's hallways are broken out by gangs who are trying to make it harder to be seen. These bulbs are not frequently replaced, so the residents use flashlights to make their way down the halls. These flashlights were handed out by a campaigning politician. In many places, the floor tiling has worn through to the concrete. The medicine cabinets of two adjacent apartments are actually formed from a single piece of metal and so have been used to crawl through during robberies and assaults. The thin sheet metal of the kitchen cabinets has rusted through in many places so that dishes have to be stacked around the hand-sized holes. Chicago's elevated trains pass within 100 feet or 30 meters of the apartment. The residents simply stop talking whenever a train roars by. The apartment has a tub but no shower. The children have never experienced a shower. Since the faucet in the tub won't shut off, boiling hot water continually runs. The rivers try to dampen this noise by closing the bathroom door. The tub is used to wash their clothes and also the dishes whenever the kitchen sink quits working. The boilers continually break down in the Horner buildings. The garbage chutes are too narrow to handle the trash and the building is full of roaches. There are maggots in the overfull garbage incinerator area. The river's first floor apartment has two bathrooms and five bedrooms, and usually 12 residents. One toilet periodically releases the odor of spoiled meat. After many years, the basement source of the odor was found during a building inspection. In 1989, the basement was inspected by a new manager who reported finding roaches, sewage, garbage, junk, dead rodents, and other animals. The sight of this caused the building manager to vomit. In addition, the basement contained 2,000 appliances and replacement kitchen cabinets, some of which were brand new but would not work because they had rusted while being allowed to sit in water. Many appliances had been pilfered for their motors and wiring, which was taken to be sold as scrap. Many tenants were angered to learn that they had gone months with broken appliances while the authorities lent their replacements rust in the basement. 
People had lived over this filth and stench for 15 years before the Chicago Housing Authority so-called discovered it. When an apartment was vacated, the Chicago Housing Authority used to have the money to make it ready for the next tenant. Now many are simply boarded up. The heat and water remain operating in the vacated apartments, though nobody is living there, so these vacant homes are often broken into to be used by gangs or drug dealers. Often, area residents remove the sinks, toilets, and metal piping from the vacated rooms to be sold as scrap for a few dollars. One year, just before Christmas, a homeless group broke into some Horner apartments to have a place to live. The Chicago Housing Authority tried to remove them over liability concerns. The tenants often shared hot food with these temporary neighbors. A 1982 audit by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development found numerous problems with the Chicago Housing Authority. For example, they didn't know how many apartments were vacant, or even how many they had in total. They found that one-third of the elevators were not working, even though the buildings contained 5 to 15 floors. None of the 2,300 employees had ever been laid off or fired. The audit said, the Chicago Housing Authority was operating in a state of profound confusion and that nobody was minding the store, and in fact, nobody genuinely cared about the residents. Eighty-five percent of Horner households are headed by the mother. The father is gone and often unrespected by his children due to his absence, drug use, or unemployment. There is a caring and well-liked 50-year-old man who looks through the garbage of nearby businesses for discarded balls, plastic jewelry, and flowers, and such, which he then gives to the area residents. Lejo gets some of her clothes from a second-hand store, and the rest are purchased through layaway. This means that the store will set aside or lay away your purchases while you make payments on them. She arranges for the layaway purchases to be paid off at Christmas, Easter, and the start of the school year. One Christmas, in addition to clothes, she bought Lafayette a radio, Faro an Atari game, and each of them a $10 watch. LeJo received $900 per month in welfare and food stamps and spends 1% of her income to cash the check, 13% on rent, 40% on food, one-third on clothes and supplies, and 9% on burial insurance for her children, for reasons that will be obvious in the following discussion. In 1986, President Reagan's Secretary of Education found Chicago schools to be the worst in the nation. About 40% of Horner area students drop out of high school, compared to the nationwide average of 25%. The Horner Area Schools lost funding for all of its art and music classes in 1980. Notice that if we fail to educate our children, then it is equivalent to discarding them, their lives, their potentials, and the further contributions they would have made to our civilization. Do we do this to save a few dollars? To this description of poverty and poor living conditions, we next add drugs, gangs, and violence to get the remainder of the picture of life in the inner cities of the U.S. Those of us humans who live under these conditions often grow to have feelings of hopelessness. Kotlowitz reports that there are 40 violent crimes per 1,000 Horner residents, compared to an average of 6 per 1,000 in the U.S. Violent crimes are assaults, rapes, robberies, and murders. Every three days, someone at Horner is either beaten, stabbed, or shot, mostly over drugs. The violence goes on and on, and nobody gets used to it. Three gunshots. Then two right after. They sent the students from South Hill Alternative High School on this bus scrambling for safety. It was the frightening climax of a scene that started when a couple of students exited the bus. According to court documents obtained by 24 Hour News 8, witnesses say the students walking off the bus were chased by other teens. When the teens came back, witnesses described yelling, cussing, and gang signs flashed. The students on the bus were watching. Some were yelling out the windows, and you can see the figure of someone walking around the bus then something happening outside makes many of the students duck. Finally, shots rang out. 
It's a frightening scene for Kamika Tate to watch. I just thank God none of them was hurt. Her 12-year-old son was on that bus. When we came home, he just started crying. He was like, Mom, I'm so glad to see you. You know, he was shook up. It was a frightening thing for him. Kamika says she's used to gang fights and crime in the city she grew up in. But this, she says, was too much. Does your son still talk about it now? Yes, he still talks about it. You think he'll ever forget it? No. <laughs> Gunshots around Horner are a common occurrence. When gunshots are heard, LeJo moves the children into the building's central hallway. She makes them stay there until 15 minutes after the gunfire has ended. Bullets have entered LeJo's apartment. When gunshots are heard in the classroom, the students habitually get down on the floor. Some of our teenagers today say that you know you are a gang member when you see your family take cover from gunfire by getting into the bathtub. All of the area's children, including Lafayette and Farrow, live among this violence. Lafayette was given $8 on his birthday to buy earphones for his radio, but on the way to the store, gunfire broke out. As is their habitual response, the boys instantly dropped to the ground. From the Sears Tower, you could have seen them ducking the gunfire. When they felt it was safe, they forgot about going to the store and instead headed home. But during those tense moments, Lafayette lost $7.50 of his $8 birthday money. Three days after Lafayette's birthday, there was gunfire outside the apartment as two rival gangs fired each other from the windows of two high-rise buildings. During the shootout, the school day ended and children began to leave the school building, which is across the street from Horner. Farrell started to walk right into the area of the gunfire, so LeJoe and Lafayette yelled out of the window at him. He stopped, then he ran and ducked from one tree to the next. There were police officers in the area, but they had mistakenly thought that they were the targets of the gunfire and stayed in their car. Pedestrians stay motionless on the ground during the gunfire, as it's their learned response to this event. Nobody was hurt and no arrests were made. Kotlowitz later called the police headquarters and found that there was no record at all that this had occurred. Kotlowitz points out that Lafayette and Farrow knew the gunfire had occurred. The gangs are there to sell drugs. They have wandering sentries who warn of approaching police. They mark out territories by marking the buildings with their symbol, for example, a star. The members identify themselves by wearing certain colors or designs, or by twisting their hat to a certain side. They will attack rival gangs who try to sell drugs in their area. If members of one gang enter the area of another gang, they will be beaten, shot at, or killed. Gangs store their guns in a safe house, which is often a non-member's apartment. This person will be paid in money or in drugs for the use of their apartment. Most of the drugs are sold to people who live outside the area. They drive their cars into the area just to buy drugs. Drug customers park at the gang's building and then wait for the drugs to be brought out. The police never catch gang leaders with any drugs on their person because they do not handle the drugs themselves. They have their helpers do that. No Horner resident dares to report drug dealers to the police for fear of being hurt or killed themselves. If you were to call the police and they came to your door to talk to you, then everyone would know that you were the one who had called the police. It is usually the lower ranking gang members who are arrested. While serving time in local jails, Gang members often recruit new members into joining them. The $50 billion annual profit from the manufacture, distribution, and sale of illegal drugs have resulted in this situation, and it is affecting much of the world. The appetite for drugs is responsible for much havoc in those countries that grow and process drugs. For example, from 2007 to 2017, about 100,000 persons were murdered among Mexico's drug gangs as they fought to supply profitable, illegal drugs to the U.S. market. If you buy illegal drugs to have a good time, 
you are directly responsible for the resulting misery of a drug war ravaged people in parts of Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, and you are funding the 25,000 man Taliban army through its poppy business. Gangs exist to sell drugs, and this is wreaking much havoc within our own city, just as it did during Prohibition. The death rates due to gun violence is the same in Miami and Colombia, in Chicago and Guyana, and in New Orleans and Honduras. This gang warfare would end instantly if these hard drugs were legalized, but that requires us to allow everyone to choose for themselves. The world has to choose between legalized drugs or gang murders numbering in the hundred thousands. We lower drug usage by decreasing injustice because some of us use drugs to escape misery while others use drugs just for fun. Some people in the U.S. are buying and using drugs because life seems hopeless. This shows that we have much work to do in freeing our own nation from injustice. Some nations treat drug addiction as a health problem while others treat it as a criminal activity. Which do you think it is? Is it better to conduct a 50-year drug war, legalize drugs, hospitalize addicts, or put one million U.S. citizens, which is one half a percent of the population, in jail for drug usage? What do you think? Gangs often recruit young children to do their dirty work. For example, near Horner, they recently had a 14-year-old boy shoot a member of a rival gang. The gang members know that the courts treat children less harshly and that the children cannot be held in prison past their 21st birthday. They are rarely held more than 20 days. Gang leaders might buy groceries and shoes for the neighborhood who need them. They sometimes throw neighborhood parties with food, games, and live music and show off their expensive cars to impress youngsters. When LeJo's oldest son Terrence was just 10 years old and not yet in the 6th grade, he was taken up by a gang leader. He dropped out of school in the 7th grade. He was taught to handle a gun and would earn as much as $200 a day Though he was only 10 years old, he would leave the house and not come back for days or even weeks. When LeJo went to that drug dealer to demand her son back, he responded that Terrence is his son now. LeJo repeatedly had the police get her son, but he would remain at home for just a few weeks before leaving again. Once Paul went with his son, Terrence, to see the drug dealer. The dealer told Paul that it's Terrence's choice to be here. Paul responded that, My son is just 12 years old. You are taking advantage of him. When Paul made more forceful threats, he was suddenly surrounded by the drug dealer's helpers. One of them reached into a sack and asked, Do you want me to pop him? Paul and Terrence were allowed to leave unharmed and the thought of his father being killed was enough to scare Terrence into staying home for a while. When describing this inner city situation, parents say, I lost my child to the neighborhood and to the lure of gangs and drug money. Some parents will lock their children within the home and say, Thank God I have a 13-year-old child who is still mine. Terrence said that he was most affected when he saw that his mother was so fed up with him that she quit giving the world to him. He became a father at age 14, and by 18, he had been arrested 46 times. Terrence told his younger brother Lafayette to stay in school and to keep to himself. He said, stay away from crooked people and tell them no if they ask you to do something for them. LeJo has three children who are older than Lafayette and Farrell, and triplets who are younger than them. The three oldest have dropped out of school and have each been in jail. Her oldest daughter has worked as a prostitute to support her drug habit. LeJo knew of people who had managed to move out of the area just to find the same conditions elsewhere. LeJo says she would die before letting a gang take another son. She vows that the lives of her younger children will be different because she will not allow the same mistakes to be repeated. The younger ones will have a childhood, graduate from high school, 
move away, get good paying jobs, and raise a family. She is the guidepost for her children. Lafayette refused to play with a certain group of children because they would try to get him to join their gang. He says that the only way to make it out of the projects is to make no friends and to keep to yourself. Then you will not get talked into joining gangs or participating in illegal activities. He says that he is going to move to a classy suburb that has four foot high, one meter tall flowers growing everywhere. And he says you can sit out all night and nothing will happen to you. The boys sometimes argue about whether there is any place that doesn't have gangs. When Lafayette was 10 years old, he saw a man stumble into their building and die of a gunshot received during a gun battle just outside their home. The bloodstains were still visible two weeks later. And two weeks after this incident, yet another gun battle broke out while the kids were outside playing. One nearby girl was shot in the leg. Lafayette and Farrell ran and hid in some trash until it was safe to come out. When one gang used machine guns and shotguns to kill a rival gang member, even this neighborhood was shocked at the viciousness of the attack. Once, when a 15-year-old gang member was shot in broad daylight, a crowd gathered around the body. Farrell vividly recalls how the dead boy's sister repeatedly wailed, He is not dead. The gang that murdered the boy also threatened to interrupt his funeral. They said that they would storm the funeral and turn over his casket. This caused the boy's family to keep the funeral arrangement as quiet as possible. The funeral's preacher commented that the only chance he has to talk to some young people about the love of God is while they attend funerals. There was a general feeling among the young people at the funeral that they too might not reach adulthood. These moments often gave Pharaoh a piercing headache and once caused Lafayette to ask Pharaoh if there were stores in heaven. The never-ending knife and gun violence is what had prompted Lejo to purchase the funeral insurance mentioned above. A while later, both boys refused to attend a family funeral because they hadn't yet gotten over the previous one. All these murders and deaths occurred in the summer of 1987, while Lafayette and Pharaoh, at the ages of 12 and 9, knew more funerals than weddings. The violence and anxiousness caused Pharaoh to begin to stutter. He also began to tremble when he heard loud noises. A few weeks after the funeral, he fainted when bullets tore past the living room window. After that, he began to spend much time staring into space. He showed more life while at school because he felt safer there. Pharaoh worked hard to compete in the school's annual spelling bee contests spending three weeks studying a 14-page list of words and came in second place. His teacher took the class on trips to nearby museums so that the children could see that there is life outside Horner. Lafayette saw three teenagers throw Molotov cocktails through the windows of the apartment next door. This was also not reported in the press. The burned-out apartment simply remained boarded up for the next two years. Lafayette began to deal with bad events by not talking about them. His face no longer showed much emotion except for fear and loneliness, but his darting eyes missed little. He said that he has no friends, only associates, because friends are someone you can trust. Lafayette once commented, If I grow up, I'm going to be a bus driver. Kotlowitz points out that Lafayette said if I grow up rather than when I grow up. Ricky was Lafayette and Farrell's friend. Ricky saw his cousin shot to death by people who he said did not feel sorry about hurting someone and that this began to make him too stop feeling for other people. After that incident, whenever Ricky got into a fist fight, he said that he began to relive his cousin's last moments and that this makes his anger turn into such a rage that he doesn't even care if he kills someone. 
But Joe was robbed by two teenagers who were armed with a knife. During the robbery, they severed the nerves between two of her fingers. But Joe grew more short-tempered from the daily worries of shootings, gangs, her son's stutter, and her daughter's drug habit. She said she felt as if her insides were being shredded and that if she knew beforehand what her children would have to suffer through, she would have returned them to her womb. But Joe was once reminiscing about her and Paul's earlier dreams of moving into a wood frame house that had a backyard, a fence, and a porch where they could sit in rocking chairs and grow old. Then her older son Terrence was arrested for armed robbery, and the Department of Public Aid informed her that her aid would be cut off because they had learned that her husband sometimes stayed with her. They learned this by reading Kotlowitz's first newspaper article about the lives of Lafayette and Farrow. Kotlowitz used the $2,000 he was paid to pay Terrence's bail. LeJoe describes the area by saying that there are no children here because they have seen way too much. By the time they reach adolescence, they have confronted more terror than most people encounter in a lifetime. They are forced to make choices that more experienced adults would find difficult. They live with fear and they experience death. This causes some young people to lash out by joining gangs, selling drugs, or even inflicting pain on other people. The Joe says that at the same time, they show that they are still children by playing baseball and marbles and such. A mentally disturbed woman, Lori Dan, entered an elementary school in a higher class part of Chicago and killed two students and injured six others. This was in the national news. There were calls for more school security and a team of crisis psychologists were brought in to help the students deal with the event. Two days later at the Horner School, a nine-year-old was shot by a stray bullet during a gang fight, but nothing was said in the press. In the summer of 1988, two men broke into a Horner apartment to steal a television and a video player, which they sold for $120 to buy drugs. During the robbery, they killed the mother, her boyfriend, and her four-year-old daughter. They also stabbed an eight-year-old girl 48 times and left her for dead, but when she was found the next morning, she was still alive and was able to testify against her attackers. A short distance from his own home, Lafayette found an apartment building that had a grassy area. He would go there to sit on the grass and read comic books or just daydream until the security guards would run him off. In the fall of 88, when he was almost 14 years old, he and a friend were caught shoplifting at a video store. They were not arrested, they were just properly scared by the store personnel. This made LeJo worry that she was about to lose another son to the neighborhood. The Chicago Stadium is close to the Horner neighborhood and is home to two professional sports teams, the Bulls and the Blackhawks. When there were sporting events, the area would be flooded with the cars of fans. Lafayette, Farrell, and many other Horner kids would earn a few dollars of spending cash by helping fans find parking spots and by guarding their cars against damage or theft. On game nights, the entire area was lit up. There would be so many police cars and officers that the drug dealers would have to close down for the night. That closure of drug dealing made the residents wonder why that sort of police activity did not happen every night. They asked, why do the police protect sports fans but not Horner residents? On one such night, a police officer told Lafayette and his friends to go back home and to stay away from the stadium. Lafayette either talked back or was too slow to move, so the officer grabbed him by his collar, threw him into a puddle of water, kicked him in the rear, and then called him a punk and told him that he was not supposed to be working here. Two of Lafayette's friends ran home and returned with LeJoe in time to find Lafayette in the back seat of the police car. Then two more officers arrived and let Lafayette go. One officer told Lafayette he might get hurt out here at night. Lafayette responded that he had lived here all his life and had never been hurt except by the police. This made Lafayette begin to question his relationship with the police. It was also the first time he ever showed bitterness toward another person. LeJoe worried that Lafayette would become cynical toward the police because they had roughed him up. 
The Horner residents have mixed feelings toward the police. They know that some genuinely care about the children and that they have a dangerous job. They are shot at while on patrol, and objects are often thrown at them in their cars. But they also believe that some police officers think that they are bad people and mistreat them. The next Christmas, LeJo took her family on a bus ride to the center of Chicago to see the decorations. The children enjoyed seeing the tall buildings and the people with their fashions. LeJo remembered coming here with her own mother and eating the best popcorn she ever had tasted. She bought caramel popcorn for her children. Then two acquaintances of the family had an argument in LeJo's house. One of them pulled out a gun and fired several shots while everyone ran for cover. Not long after that, LeJo's daughter LaShawn gave birth to a baby boy who was tested positive for cocaine and opiates. In the spring of 1989, Lafayette's friend Craig was shot by a law enforcement officer who had mistaken him for another person. Craig was a special role model for Lafayette because he maintained his ability to dream aloud about the future while most everyone else said that it was no use to even bother. Craig had recently graduated from high school and was pursuing his career as a disc jockey. Medical exams found no trace of alcohol or drugs in Craig's body. The police said that he was a suspected gun runner and member of the Disciple Gang, even though his name was not on their list of 18,000 suspected gang members. The street where Craig had been shot was not part of the Disciples' gang territory. The police did not apologize to Craig's parents or even send flowers to his funeral. The death of Craig convinced Lafayette that he could be shot or jailed at any moment for doing nothing. He became depressed, collapsing in bed right after school and sleeping for long hours. His distrust of others grew and his memory began to fade. He said that if he were Craig's father, he would go shoot that police officer and that he hoped the officer would die. Two days after Craig's funeral, Lafayette lost another friend who was driving in a stolen car with four others. When the group passed the police car, they sped off and lost control, killing three of the five boys. When LeJoe told Lafayette about this, his facial expression didn't even change. He just said, he's gone, just don't talk about him. Lafayette then began to have mood swings. One moment he would act with a hot temper, show fury and revenge, and then the next moment he would show generosity and maturity. He asked a friend if he had ever thought of suicide. One month later, as the rest of the family moved to the building's hallway during gunfire, Lafayette just sat at the television. When Lafayette was 13 years old, he and three friends commandeered a vacant apartment, chose a certain earring for their symbol, and began to call themselves the Four Corner Hustlers. They were not dealing drugs, but they were practicing for the real thing. The school then labeled Lafayette as a gang member. One of the boys had a gun. When he was once shooting at the feet of the others, he accidentally shot one boy in the arm. The four boys would talk about how they wished they could be young again and at age when most are wishing they would grow up and are thinking of the future. Cot Lewis asked how could the Horner boys be expected to think of the future when it took so much just to think of the present. Lafayette's brother Terrence was next given an eight-year sentence for armed robbery. LeJo said that her children were her strength and her love, and when they are taken away from her, it's like taking a part of her. They're what she didn't have, and she had them in order to get it. At this time, a man made threats at her for refusing to go on a date with him. She lost her self-control for a moment and said that she couldn't take much more that she had to get out of this ghetto life. She worried again about losing her children to the neighborhood. She wished she could take her children and move away, but she knew she couldn't pay rent anywhere else. But Joe paid a swindler $80 because he claimed he could get her name put at the top of the list for a subsidized housing and enable her to move out of the project. The swindler was soon arrested. One day Lafayette came home to find his dog missing. He accused his father of selling the dog for drug money and called him a dope fiend. 
They had a terrible argument. Paul slumped down into a chair knowing that his son didn't respect him due to his drug usage and knew that he didn't respect himself either. The dog was then found in the kitchen. Lafayette was discouraged that his cousin Don, who had graduated from high school a year ago, still didn't have a job and was unable to move away from the projects. It worried him that even a high school diploma was not a guarantee that he would make it out of the area and have a better life. Lafayette had little to believe in because everything and everyone were failing him. Lafayette had a recurring dream of running from something that was chasing him but not being able to get away because of a strong wind. He would try to call for help but no sound would come out of his mouth. Lafayette and Farrell saw their first rainbow while they were walking to a store. Farrell ran toward it because, like other boys, he believed that you will get a wish if you catch it. After it disappeared, he came back and said that if he could have caught it, he would have wished to get his brother out of jail and his family out of the projects. He then held back a cry. Farrell was selected for the University of Illinois' Upward Bound Project for Math and Science Development as 6th through 12th graders. During the orientation meeting, each student was asked what he or she wanted to be when they grew up. Farrell answered that he would be a congressman so that he could build houses and move everyone out of the projects, and that he would also put every gang member in jail. He enjoyed going to the university each morning, getting away from the neighborhood, and feeling like a scholar. This was also the year that Farrell was given his first birthday party. LeJo was walking down the street and saw two boys shooting at other boys who were wearing the red colors of a rival gang. This time it was especially troublesome for her because the shooters could only see the backs of the other boys. They didn't even care to know for certain at whom they were shooting. LeJo then made Lafayette stop wearing red colors, hats, earrings, or anything else that could be mistaken for gang symbols and be shot at. In a two-week period, there were six shootings. A few weeks after that, Lafayette saw a friend run out of the building shot in the stomach. The violence never let up and nobody ever got used to it. Lafayette and four other boys were next caught running away from a vandalized car. Lafayette said that after seeing one boy smash the window, he ran away to avoid being blamed. At court, the judge did not even look up at him while rattling off questions about his name and age. Yet worse, a few minutes later the judge did not even remember that he had questioned Lafayette. The public defender, Ann Rhodes, said that she defends hundreds of children at a time and has just a few minutes to interview them at the courtroom entrance. She has seen children taken away from their parents after a five-minute abuse and neglect trial. She is scared by the overload of cases, the absence of parents, the hastiness and confusion of the trials, and worst of all, the inattention to the children. She says that our kids are our future and we are not doing our jobs. In Lafayette's trial, she said she had to defend all five boys but was given only five minutes to talk with all of them. The judge found the boys guilty, though none of them had been seen smashing the window. The judge said that he had no doubt the boys did it, and it didn't matter that they claimed they were innocent, because they always do. He said that they were a threat to the public out there breaking into people's cars. During the trial, Lafayette was not given a chance to talk or to declare his innocence, and he was mad that the one boy didn't admit to having broken the window. Lafayette was sentenced to one year of probation and assigned 100 hours of community service at a boys club. During this service, he found that he enjoyed teaching children how to catch balls. While LeJoe was walking down the street, she saw several boys beating up on one other boy, and she saw Lafayette in the middle of them yelling for them to stop. LeJoe ran up and pushed her way to the center, trying to stop them as she yelled at the boys. Just as it looked like the boys were going to turn on her and Lafayette, another boy ran up to help. Then everyone dispersed. On the way home, Lafayette dropped to his knees and said, I'm tired, Mom. She helped her son to his feet, 
and knew that he was just tired of being In the inner cities today, it is common for half the men to be either jailed or killed by age 25. You might acquire a feeling of hopelessness as you realize that this will be your future. It shows the strength of human character that 100% of us do not turn to drugs or crime in such a situation. Notice that our daily news programs rarely discuss the quality of life for the one in six of us who are poor and it rarely discusses possible approaches to making things better. Instead, the news lists only dramatic crimes in between oatmeal commercials. Notice that none of this is discussed by our politicians. We improve our civilization only with unflowered debate of problems and possible solutions and by acting, measuring resulting changes, correcting approaches, and trying again. Nothing will improve if we stick our heads in the sand and pretend that we are all going to become billionaires. Most of us measure success in life in terms of healthy and happy children, families, and communities, not wealth, power, or war. We have solved every problem in history that has come our way. That's how we are still here. Typically, a solution is found only after first stumbling around in the dark. Through the coming decades, we will pull efforts and make life better for all of us. What are some first things for us to focus our efforts on? In the U.S. through recent decades, about one in five of our children are living in a home whose income falls below the poverty line. Yet no mention of this is made in the news or by our political leaders. In the daily news, there is little discussion about poverty or of the inequality of wealth and income but a second-by-second -second report is given for stock market averages and other economic indicators. Why doesn't the nation and the news give a running report on infant mortality, income inequality, college graduation, and literacy rates and such? Today's computerized economic system is capable of showing the change in GDP with each and every purchase you make at its stores. We could publicly display and debate computed measures of the aspects of life that matter most to us, but we aren't. 